Hi, thank you for having me. My name is Ben Callan Williams, and I'm an artist who works across a range of medium and context, from photography to sculpture, video, and installations. I'm fascinated by new technologies and what they can tell us about ourselves. I see the world as a reflection of the human condition, sometimes holding a mirror up to us. As a result, I became interested in machine learning and artificial intelligence and what we can learn about ourselves through the use of these and also pose the question, what do we want the future to look like? By questioning emerging technologies in their early stages, we can shape them rather than having them shape us. So I'm going to talk about several ways of questioning technology that are present in my practice and I'm going to do this through the lens of three different projects. The first being a project called The Living Archive, which I was invited to collaborate on by the choreographer Wayne McGregor, a new work which he was already developing with Google Arts and Culture at the time. I created the video element of the work, which questioned visual authenticity within the realm of the machine. The second is a project called Past Life, a collaboration between myself and the makeup artist is in my French which questioned our understanding of beauty, potential built-in biases into AI systems, and the potential dangers of technology such as deep fakes. The third is a video installation called Cold Flux for the Antarctic Pavilion at the London Zion Biennale, with whom I worked with two brilliant people from Google, Bryce Cronkite Ratcliffe and Damien Henry, and then worked with the musician and artist Geica, who provided the sound. This work questioned our understanding of landscape in the digital age and the new realities being formed. So firstly, the Living Archive, an AI performance experiment. This took place in the Los Angeles Music Center in 2019. And as mentioned, the project was a collaboration between Wayne McGregor and Google Arts and Culture, which I then contributed to with the video installation that was part of the LA performance. Here's a trailer of the work. So what is the Living Archive? It's an experiment between Studio Wayne McGregor and Google Arts and Culture, a tool for choreography powered by machine learning, which generates original movement inspired by Wayne's 25 year archive. Part of the tool is for it to be used by capturing the dancer's movement, analyzing it, then extending it in real time. So I was asked by Wayne if I could create a video installation for his performance of the dance that was made through exploring the Living Archive. So I spent some time at the Google Arts and Culture Lab in Paris and started discussing the tool that had been developed and its capabilities with the team. At that point, the tool was outputting the dancer's stick figures and images that resembled lifelike forms, along with the start of some abstract representations. It was around this point in the process that I started thinking about this idea of authenticity. Authenticity within the digital, especially around AI-generated imagery. We pose the question, if a computer was to dance, how would it dance and indeed, how would it want to be presented? This question formed the basis of our exploration. Following this, a 15 minute piece of AI-generated dance was created. We were able to hijack it and visually output it in different ways so that it didn't resemble a literal human form. You see, as humans, and I'm sure you are aware of this, we have a body and a physical structure that allows us to move in a certain way and only express ourselves with what we have. So on this project, would we confine ourselves to something that resembled human form when we could show movement through a whole spectrum of ways and ask the question, what might be the most authentic way for the computer to express its movement through a screen? Look, of course, this is a flawed process in itself. Because for us to interpret it, we would need to engage with our human senses in some way, ears, eyes, touch, etc. However, regardless, this is a necessary parameter, so we chose a screen on our eyes. Initially, we started by looking at the aesthetic of the raw AI movement code itself, 
presenting itself up to us through letters, numerals and symbols that we're familiar with. We then started interrogating the aesthetic of that code and made environments that AI-generated movement could react to. Each part of the body had a representational node that moved around, LH for left hand, LF for left foot and so on. We then went on to investigate different visualizations of the code. Perhaps using an alphabet that humans created might not have been the most authentic way of the computer representing itself. Perhaps dots moving around a screen, animated lines, a static energy that reacts to the intensity of movement, a close-up to what it might have chosen as a mode of presentation. We then started exploring visualizations that had more of a lifelike quality, from cellular structures to figures that had an angelic feel, to the nodes of the body that interacted with the dot matrix. Some had an organic lifelike quality to them. Perhaps the machine would want to reach a middle ground, a compromise, create something that we as humans could relate to. Here you can see the movement of the dot matrix being created by the nodes. It's almost an entity being born, code made physical. Following on from this, we start making visualizations using the original stick figure, but reworking it in a range of ways. For example, the moving figure creating scrolling topographies. We finally started exploring images that were closer to the human form. Here you can see some of the AI generated dance. What was wonderful about this was that some of it was beautiful and some of it actually very ugly and strange. And it's the ugly and strange parts that fascinated me. You see, as humans, we're socially conditioned to understand beauty in a certain way. And I'll come to that later in a little bit more detail. But this particular code didn't have that condition. I felt it was integral not to edit out any of this so-called ugliness, so not to privilege our own human lens. Perhaps it's within this movement, rather than the specific rep visual representation, that we can start to truly get a sense of generated authenticity. Perhaps these parts that we perceive as being ugly are the parts that the machine would enjoy the most, its own way of dancing, its own way of moving. It's here where we start to see potential new realities rather than fictions or emulations of our human world, digital worlds existing alongside our own with their own unique set of hierarchies and rules. I tried to bring this sense of authenticity into the way the video was shown on stage. I felt it was important to have a strong sense of and presence of technology. Almost as if part of the computer had been ripped out and placed there. It needed to be simultaneously raw and visceral whilst having a fragility to it, much like our own bodies. Indeed, also how fragile so much of the digital is. The screen had a presence of its own, sometimes completely transforming the stage and becoming one with the dancers. And at other times, the code and the dancers were seen in unison, the screen acting as, as a digital insight into the process of the choreography itself. In other parts of the show, we highlighted the seeming fragility of the screen by exposing the transparent structure. The screen had a human body-like quality to it, from structure to its external skin. And in some parts, the human dancers watched the digital body on the screen, a shifting of hierarchies. The digital dancer took center stage. I started wondering if we'll allow the new aesthetics that AI presents to us that don't necessarily conform to our values to challenge the way we look at the world. Or will we simply reject them as being ugly and strange? I continued this line of questioning in the next project, moving from the body to the face, thinking about beauty, 
authenticity. And in fact, the potential dangers of the technology in question. Over the last couple of years, as many people have, I seem to endlessly be looking at people's faces in little boxes in meetings. Their faces isolated from a physical body, becoming a new reality itself. I wanted to explore this endless landscape of digital faces. I was quite aware of algorithms that are being developed to generate lifelike faces from large data sets on the internet. I wondered what the point was at that time, and the aesthetic was quite ubiquitous, rather than it being challenged. And of course, this is the case with many new creative technologies when they emerge. Oil paint revolutionised the way works of art could be created outdoors and at ease, away from the studio. And now is used to explore a myriad of different themes. Photography, once for a select few, creating comes from equipment, is now part of our daily activities. And so, if history is anything to go by, we're just at the start of GAN being used as a tool in the arsenal of an artist. But as with photography and all painting, we're now beyond the point of showcasing the technology as an end in itself. Indeed, the algorithm used in this project was trained on photographs. In some ways, the closest mode of capture to the human eye. I'm now interested by models that are trained on a numerous different visual inputs and styles created by humans. Photographs, paintings, drawings, etchings, the scans, and perhaps emulations of the way some insects and animals see. Perhaps by feeding in numerous different visual styles, without predetermining what the output will be like, i.e. a photograph or a painting, we can start to get closer to what might be a potentially authentic way for computers to generate images on their own, rather than solely a derivative of human mark making or existing technology. We can now use machine learning and AI to interrogate and ask questions about our current human condition and indeed our evolving relationships with the same technologies that we're harnessing. I wanted to disrupt these existing models that perhaps have inherent biases towards what a face should look like in terms of understood notions of beauty. I wanted to do this with a strange data set. To carry out this project successfully and with the rigor that I thought deserved, I decided I needed to collaborate with someone that had a great knowledge of beauty and indeed spent a great deal of time questioning how we understand and look at the face. The visionary makeup artist Isamai French agreed to work with me on this project. She enlightened me that for millennia, artists, mathematicians and photographers all try to define beauty. Indeed, we are captivated, moved and fascinated by beauty. She highlighted that some of the earliest rules governing the ideals of human beauty that we know of were set by those in authority who asserted that beauty could be recognised, defined and created according to absolute laws of proportion and mathematics. In classical Greece, that meant harmony of form. A perfect body was one that was able to be calculated. If we were to follow these criteria and sculpt a marble person, we should somehow manage to produce something that could be seen or at least by the Greeks, as beautiful, and as far more beautiful than any real human body. With this in mind, we created a set of instructions for the generation of self-portraits for the opposite of what we generally accept as beauty, in order to create a data set for the existing models to be trained on. The instructions made the participants distort their faces through pulling it with their hands, their muscles, and with making marks using lipstick. Through training GANs on these photographs of contorted faces, algorithms were lured into creating the unexpected. The result, a series of uncanny faces, familiar yet distant, a modernization of the face, some adhering to and some transcending social and cultural norms. Many of the disrupted faces are unnerving, complete with lacerations and scarring. 
original disrupted images going through the digitalized learning process. Perhaps the computer is trying to tell us something, to warn us of itself, its unseen dangers that lie ahead, deep fakes, the potential for disseminating misinformation amongst others, externalized as physical trauma in these images. Or perhaps it could be nothing related to that at all. Rather the machine's naivety creating a mirror to our own current condition created by preconceived ideals of beauty, a tendency to recall at the unfamiliar, when in fact, as this process has shown, the unfamiliar is in all of us, if we laid it out. Within this set of images, it was the AI process itself that independently interpreted and caused these lacerations and erosions on some, face, on some faces. The images aren't designed to glamorise violence. In fact, they haven't really been designed in any sense by the human hand. They're just a product of an explorative process. But the AI's corruption of the human face, from simple playful gestures that a child might do, such as pulling a face or marking it with lipstick, may serve as a reminder of the gap between current machine learned perception and ours. Indeed, it might raise a larger question in regards to what a computer might deem to be beautiful. Could perhaps a computer's idea of beauty be different to ours? Perhaps a computer has a better understanding of beauty, challenging our perhaps outdated ideals. Was a computer in fact generating images that it did deem as being beautiful, and it is us that is misinterpreting them. As we once relied on a system of rules to define beauty, perhaps we can also do this again, but in a far more advanced way. So now, moving to the landscapes that we exist in as people. This is the third and final project I'm going to talk about. Cold flux shown in the Antarctic Pavilion at the London Zion Biennale was a project that stemmed from an expedition I participated in to Antarctica with the polar explorer Robert Swan. Whilst en route, I filmed the Larsen B ice shelf, which splintered off from the Antarctic Peninsula in 2002 and has been sadly disintegrating ever since. I wanted to reconstruct the haunting images of the icebergs using a thing that has led to its demise, technology. With Bryce and Demian, we refined an algorithm that could be trained on the video footage and generate original imagery. Yet with no hierarchies or recognition, just image, texture and tone. Our view of how we understand the world has fundamentally been altered since Tournachon took the first successful aerial photograph in 1858 from a hot air balloon. As Paul Verillo suggests, technology accelerates the perception of space as much as it morphs the perception of time. 
We can see the world from afar now. Our landscapes of ever-expanding human systems show our altered world as abstract pattern. However, in contrast, the images we see from cameras on the ground or in the sky, the resulting video was continually shifting, unstable. A slow tracking shot shows the sides of the icebergs while the vast blocks of ice move within the shots themselves. As a computer learnt more, the image crystallised from the indistinguishable to the recognisable, strangely mirroring the freezing process of the continent, flowing and moving within the steady frame. In fact, it was the earlier stages in the training process that interested me the most. The images that are most unstable, fluid yet solid, they somehow conveyed more of the essence of the continent than a clear representational image. In these early videos, the continent presents itself to us as being in a state of constant flux, a prediction or a recording. Virillo reflects on the status of the image in the age of artificial intelligence with the creation of vision machines, leading to the industrialization of vision. These novel ways of seeing, taking us into new worlds entirely, beyond the limits of space and time, outside of nature and the material world into a new dimension with its own temporality, spatiality and modes of being. The work potentially presents to us some of this new digital materiality that is starting to exist alongside our own. To me, in fact, I see the generated image within this process as being closer to what is really happening in our world than a still image or video, for instance. It accelerates time rather than a static fragment of the past. Within it, we see the world continually morphing and shifting. A world in transition. Has the generated video, in fact, revealed a deeper truth about the world, rather than being a fake of an original? Perhaps a computer's vision of the Earth is closer to reality than our own. Vibrating atoms and shifting tectonic plates. Or is it a new reality that will exist alongside ours? I'll leave you with a quote by the painter Paul Clay. He said, now objects perceive me. Perhaps he was right. So that concludes my talk and I hope you find these questions as interesting and perplexing as I do. Thank you very much.